Welcome to July. This is the July 3rd, 2024 Aries Working Group call. Um, this is a hyperledger call, so the antitrust policy and code of conduct are in effect. Links to those are in the agenda. The link to the agenda can be found on the hyperledger wiki, also in the Zoom chat. You're welcome to make any changes that are useful to the community. Don't uh, fret the non-live editing. It'll still save uh, if you edit, hit edit and add stuff and then save, and it will be merged into all the rest of that. Um, any uh, announcements we should have on our list, but don't. Any release status uh, notes on related projects? Nothing a lot new. Um, Akapai, we've got um, Jamie Hale assigned to um, get the 1.0 release out and figure out all the pieces. We're very, very close close on having the first release candidate. Um, so we're looking forward to that as well. The first uh, DIDCOM 2 uh, PR was merged um, that Micah had a lot to do with. And um, it's not fully complete. That was the plan. But um, we do have that one merged now. So um, will that work will continue on to get us to full DIDCOM 2 functionality. Excellent. I was hoping to hear something about that and it's stoked to hear that it is merged. Good work, all. I'll jump in, Sam, on uh, Aries VCX. Um, we are doing uh, various work items, but one that I wanted to specifically bring up in this context is that we are looking to remove uh, the various crates and tools and support for anything related to the Indie SDK or legacy uh, tooling around it um, because we have moved everything to we have support for the sh shared uh, components but uh, want to make sure that nobody is depending on these tools before we go ahead and just axe them um, we believe that this is just was being consumed by abso who is no longer using these tools but uh, want to see if anybody is using areas v6 that we're not aware of that would be impacted by this change so i will drop a link by the Aries VCX for a GitHub issue if you are using Aries VCX and this would be a negative impact to you. Uh, totally. I have a, uh, two recommendations related to that on, on the repo. Um, one is to drop a note in the readme that that's happened. And two, create a tag pointing to the last commit where those are available so that you can link to it and say, if you're still using it, here is the last commit that you know the, the the newest that it is is still and that way people can get to it if they need and then i think you can proceed ahead boldly having done those things got it does that make sense and thank you for so, the recommendation yeah no, I, I, that would make sense part of it's an awareness the other part is like earmark the exact spot where like it still existed and and then i think you can proceed boldly because you're you've provided a a way for folks to sort of figure that out um, and so, uh, and so, yeah, the, the awareness is fantastic. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, but doing that on the readme would help. And the, both of those tasks are relatively simple. I mean, the, the issue is good too. Um, but, uh, but you can leave those other things in there without really harming your future work on the code base for a while, um, in a, in a nice way. Cool. Awesome. Glad to hear progress there. That's awesome. Any other updates? Awesome. Main topic. Uh, I've tailed these along because we do need to discuss these. Um, but uh, um, the main topic today is did TDW, Mr. Curran, is going to um, give us a, a review and help teach us. Um, and again, this is both valuable for us here on the call, but the recording will also be uh, quite useful to point folks to to help uh, understand that. So, uh, oh, and a good note from Colton in the chat, Akapai will now print out the did in the ver key during auto provisioning, which is handy. Um, nice. Cool. Uh, anything, any other adjustments to the agenda we wanna make before we turn it over to Steven? All right, the floor is yours. All right. Did TDW, um, 
So I'll go through, uh, I have this, but this is of course a conversation, jump in any time. Um, did TDW, TDW means trust did web, or if you say it fast, trusted web. Um, ah, is, that, is that why there's not a trusted, so that you exactly. can say it fast? Yes. That's clever. I was going to ask you that. That was a John thing. Um, verifiable, portable, web-based method with history. So that's the uh, magic of it. Um, I'm going to go quickly through the background parts. The main focus of this will be on the mechanics and how we get to where we are, because this audience I know knows a lot about dids and things like that. Um, and so get to why we get there. We know why we have dids, decentralized, self-created, self-controlled, published identifiers, um, cryptographic public key that that is controlled and that and that can have a history. And uh, one of the things I don't mention here is um, uh, the need for a service endpoint as well, a, a place where you can say, hey, you can contact me for certain services within the did doc. So things like didcom and, and other services like that can be achieved. Lots of uses for it. The biggest thing is for a uh, for signing and, and encryption back and forth um, to be used. So publishing a, 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 a series of public keys, multiple public keys of different types, being able to con demonstrate control over them, be able to sign things so that those uh, things can be verified. Um, lots of things to be done that are an improvement over the techniques we have today. So we have, you know, PKI X509 um, that give us a way to have a key, but not um, all of the other features that a did can give you. And that's why dids are interesting. Um, did methods, of course. Um, did methods, dids don't really define how you go about resolving a did. It just says when you resolve a did, um, you get back a did doc. Um, there are many ways to resolve a did. There are many ways to publish a did and a did doc. And, um, and in fact, there are 195 of them when I last checked, which was three weeks ago. So probably that's old. Um, why is because there's a, uh, you know, a, a rush. Everyone thinks um, that if they add a did to their platform, their blockchain, their mechanism um, for communication, that, that people will start to, that'll be an added feature. And it, it creates more problems and, and have actually held up the, the deployment of DIDs than anything else. So um, it's an interesting problem. There is a universal resolver but, uh, that is in a public place that DIFF publishes, um, but not recommended for pr production, although you could run and deploy your own universal resolver with whichever DID methods you want. Um, DIDs on ledgers are the first place that people went to, and there's really, really good reasons for having DIDs on ledgers. Um, public data is exactly what ledgers are good at, um, putting public data out there that anyone can get to. Um, robust, always available, replicated with many nodes, many, many copies. Um, you don't need to contact the owner of the DID to get the DID document. You're going to a third party, a separate party. So you're, there's no call home for getting the DID. Um, they're immutable once you publish them. Um, they can be updated and all the versions remain available. There's verification required, uh, authorization required to update the DID. Um, all of these things are, are really good. And in fact, ledger-based DIDs can never be deleted. Um, that's the theory. So, so they can last many, many years, um, a, a lasting place to find a key to verify a credential, for example. Um, challenges are uh, you have to often run a ledger, and that can be a lot of work. Um, Public ledgers have associated cryptocurrencies, and that can be a challenge. Um, there are many types of ledgers, and so and that's what really triggered the proliferation of DID methods. Um, there will not be one DID uh, one ledger, so you got to figure out which ones are are worth supporting, which ones are worth using, and therefore having them. And interfacing to a ledger it can be complicated, and certainly. 
harder than simply doing a get. And that's um, that's an interesting challenge. So the simplest way to publish a did is did web. Um, you don't get a history. Um, so if you had a previously active public key and you replace the the file you the, with a new did doc, that that public key essentially goes away. Um, no verification of the non-existent history. Since you don't have history, you can't verify it. Who made the change to the did doc? Who was it a hacker that broke in and published a new did doc with new keys, or or was it actually the intended owner? Um, not <clears throat> not immutable. Um, may have to be deleted disappeared because the 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 domain on which it's published goes away for whatever reason the company merges the company um, rebrands and changes its name all of those are reasons why um, all of the web reasons for things changing um, apply to this and so that's not great currently there's really three core did methods in use um, did key did peer, um, which and did key and did peer have certain specialized purposes, and then the only only public a way to publish a did that is have big um, usage, broad usage is did web. Um, it's just the easiest way to publish a did, and and usually these are used for quick and dirty uh, or, or for proof of concepts and things like that. But where a did gets used, you you just do a did web. Um, interestingly, because did web is so close to um, PKI and, and that the people don't even bother with a did and they just use a a, a key. Um, and and that's that's published at the dot well known. And so that's even less useful than than having at least a did available. So, and then all the other did methods are competing for usage with with the long tail of your low usage. So, our premise is there is not a sufficiently capable dominant did method for public did. So, what else do we do? We created a hundred ninety sixth did method. Um, we do get the irony of this, and we do agree that this is ridiculous. But there we go. So did TDW, um, similar to did web, um, but with a ledgerless verifiable history. So there's lots of concepts here that are built into this that are based on the ideas that Sam Smith um, created and, and put into um, carry. Um, we went down a path of trying to get to this same point with a thing called did web s that, um, uh, try to achieve the same goals or tries to achieve the same goals as did TDW. Um, but uh, we we just found it was too indirect that you had to um, try to generate a did doc based on a bunch of non-did related activities to get what you wanted, which what we wanted out of it, which was a did. And so um, this is a direct application of many of those techniques, but purely for the purpose of producing a did. So um, beside where a did webs did.json file, or instead of is a did.json L file, Sam Curran gets credit for the JSON L notification. The um, design of the files had been um, made and Sam pointed out that, hey, that's a thing called JSON lines, what we were using. And so uh, it's a series of JSON lines. Each line is an array and each contains a did doc version. So each, each line represents a did doc version. Um, there is a standard around high assurance DNS related to did web. That same technique can be applied to um, did TDW. So you can, bind um, a did TDW with DNS and provide um, a sec essentially a second factor of both um, the web-based and uh, the DNS tied to that did TDW. When you resolve a did TDW, you grab the JSONL file and you process it to verify the log and retrieve the entire did doc history. 
you get out of it all of the versions. Those versions are cryptographically chained together. So all the every version depends on the previous uh, version from a cryptographic um, perspective. And every version must be signed by the authorized DID controller, the key authorized by the DID controller um, to update the DID. Um, there is a self-certifying identifier that enables um, uniqueness and portability. So um, in the inception event, the creation of the DID, you generate an identifier and that identifier is put into the DID itself. So it's part of the DID and it remains unique or, or remains throughout the lifetime. That enables um, uniqueness because it's generated such that there's sufficient entropy that nobody could create a new DID TDW with the same SCID. And it enables portability that we'll talk about later. Um, and there's it's not just based on the initial key, right? No, no, it's which, larger than that. Which means that it's flexible in a post quantum world for a, yes for for handling yeah. post quantum keys. Yes, yeah. Define did URL path. Um, so the did spec is quiet on what did slash path slash two slash file is supposed to do. Um, Using did core um, capabilities, did TDW is is opinionated on that, how you get that. And there's also a did slash who is that I'll talk about in a bit, but a way to find out more information about who uh, what who is the controller of did TDW. And so this is a, a convention that we'd like to see every did method pick up, which is a slash who is. And that returns information to whoever's resolving it about who owns the did. Uh, small, very simple implementation with minimal dependencies. So that's what a did TDW looks like. No big surprise. This would be at HTTPS aviary.id slash dot well known slash this skid slash did dot json l so this skid would be a folder in the http path and there'd be a did dot json l after it um very can, can you cool. still have variable paths yes yeah okay so you can still stick a path after a dot id after the domain and that sits in between yeah this actually skid. is a path this is a path and you could also have it as a subdomain. And we're coming up with a way we think that we can make it so that you can have aviary.id as the actual location. We've got a technique we think will work for that. So but, that- But my question is, is, can you stick a different path in there? Can you have a path to- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, nice. Like, yeah. like did web. Right. Colon dids, colon 58x, so on, yes. Awesome, okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah, yeah, the, um, I'll get to that. Um, Pretty cool um, iteration technique for how we got here. We've got two implementations, one in TypeScript, one in Python. Both are less than 1,500 lines of code and include support for the pre-rotation feature that you'll see later. Um, so we're still looking for um, feedback to get um, security simplicity. And so we'll talk about where we're going next with this. Um, this is the mechanics. Here's what you were asking, Sam. So the same. So did web defines three ways to do this. One is just a raw, um, did web has a raw domain, a subdomain, and then a path. Right now we're only showing two of them because the skid has to be there. So the skid can be a path like this, or it can be a subdomain where dot well known is used. So those are the two techniques. We think we have a third that's going to work for adding the plain domain. Um, Can you just do the same thing, but without the subdomain and look for the dot well known? Or um, is it problematic yeah, to not to have skid. it in the location? You need to skid. Uh, just for uh, what we're going to do, we think um, if we put underscore and then the skid in the example.com, underscore is illegal in a TLD. So um, when you map it, you would just get example.com, um, but the skid would be known in the did. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's the plan. Uh, it does. 
I think there may be a simpler way in the, in the sense that the skid is present in the did, but under certain conditions, you just ignore it from a path perspective and that, verify that's what that it we're does. saying. That's how yeah, we're but, doing it. That's, but you're, you're yeah. going to add an underscore. And underscore dot, dot com underscore skid. And then when you transition, transform it into an HTTP, you just drop the skid. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then, so the underscore is your signal that uh, the, it's yes. not part of the path. And then you just check that the exactly. skid matches the doc you load. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Yep. Retrieve and process the log. Each entry produces a did doc. So this is what an entry looks like. It has an entry hash, a version ID, one starting with one and incrementing, a version time, which must increment and must be before now, parameters, which we'll talk about, but parameters configure how you use, how you um, generate and verify uh, documents. The did doc in two forms, and we'll talk about those two forms. And then finally, um, a data integrity proof or multiple data, data integrity proofs that are used to verify um, authorization and approval to publish this version of the doc. So every entry consists of a line of JSON. Um, it's an array and it's got each of them has these six entries in them. So let's talk about where those six things come from. Oh, actually, we'll start with the parameters. So the parameter items is, is itself a JSON array of name values um, with data for how you process the log. So configuration settings, things like what version of the spec are you using? Because we want these to last years and years, you may start with version one of the spec, but after a while, move to version two of the spec. You declare that in the configuration settings, and then the verifier can take that into account. Same with what hashing algorithms, what crypto suite you're using for the data integrity, uh, and so on, the proofs, uh, and so on. So that allows uh, a long-lasting did. Um, contained within the parameters in in certain row in certain versions, like the first one, it's got to be in the first one. Are the keys that are authorized to update the did? And those and and related to those is optional pre-rotation hashes of keys you will use in the future. Um, there may be data to manage additional features, things like portability, um, witnesses slash approvers, and so on. So we'll get to some of those features. But if the features need configuration or need extra data, those go into the parameter. So it gives us a place to put data. And then all of the parameters apply from the version they're introduced until they are later replaced. So in the first one, you have to say which version of the spec you're you're using, and then some, and that applies for all of the versions until you say, oh, I'm going to use version two now. Um, okay, that's the parameters. So you, um, this you is, call it a JSON array, but it's a struct, right? I guess I don't know. I'm no good at that stuff. Yeah, because okay. I was a little confused, but but I looked at the actual spec and it's a it's a it's an object. It's a struct where you have name value pairs. An array is just an index oriented thing. OK, yeah, cool. OK, thanks. And I think I'll drop that last line out. OK, dependencies. Um, there's a hash algorithm you're using defaults to SHA-3256, but we can the specification. Um, will dictate which possible versions you can use. So we're not going to open it up to anything, but um, this, the specification will say, oh, you know what? It's time we use these specific um, algorithms. Base32 encoding, JSON patch, which is used to define a transition from one did doc to the next. Um, there's a use of did key in the data integrity um, proof. Um, multi-base, multi-key, in particular multi-key for um, the format of keys. We are using JSON canonicalization scheme in multiple places. And finally, as mentioned, um, data integrity proofs using JCS and EDDSA. So this is the only crypto suite currently supported. So um, these sort of go from, you know, complexity and and knowledge up to um 
these are the most complex things we're doing in the dependencies, but they're all pretty well known. I think these are all, you know, relatively easy to get good libraries for and, and use them. There is an issue that um, Timo posted about, should we be using um, JWSs instead of data integrity proofs? So maybe we switch this one to JWSs, who knows? But that's the but, dependency list, pretty light. So so with JCS, you're not using like the NQuads canonicalization as part nope. of LD? No, nope. using so, JCS. So are you just evaluating the context as strings, but not ever actually loading anything there? Exactly, yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm referring to L long thread that's been over the last two yes. weeks arguing about that specific item too, so okay. Exactly. Okay. So how do you generate a skid? So I'm gonna talk about a couple of the mechanics of things. The first thing is how do you generate a skid? The way that's done is you create an input of the first five items. Notice we don't have the data integrity suite, but we have all of the other items. And um, we've got a placeholder wherever the skid is supposed to appear with a curly brace, literal string, curly brace, S-C-I-D, close curly brace. In, in wherever it's needed. So it's needed right here. So it's literally right there. Um, in the parameters, um, we've got the placeholder and in the did doc, we've got the placeholders. So wherever the skid is needed, there's at least one place guaranteed in the um, parameters that it's needed. Um, obviously in the did doc, the ID is there. Um, notice here, this is what the did doc looks like and I'm missing a curly brace I see. Um, value equals and then the did doc is in here and uh, oh i think that should be a curly brace as well so anyway if this is value it's the literal did doc if this is patch it's json patch in the first version of the did um, obviously it has to be the full did doc you don't have anything to patch from um, but in the in in subsequent versions, you would commonly use patch here, and then this would be a JSON patch applied to the previous version. So that's again, that's more about how a a um, entry is put together. So we start with this, and then we calculate the skid by doing this calculation. So JCS on the input, hash that. Base32, we use Base32 so that we can put it in the subdomain in the file system. Um, lower, so we can put it in the subdomain, so we have lowercase, and then we extract at least 28 characters. So to be valid, there must be 28 characters in the skid. And that is to make sure that it has sufficient um, randomness that it can't be um, regenerated, if you will, using quantum techniques or anything like that. Like you can't reproduce a uh, an input like this and produce an, a, an identical skid. Uh, so St Stephen, yeah. on the on the verification, do you just look at the length of the skid provided to know how many characters to yep. strip off on the left? Okay. Exactly. Um, yep. Second question, you mentioned mm -hmm. that the first one, the first line typically has a did doc and subsequent lines typically have JSON patch. Yep. Can the subsequent lines just be a whole new did doc? Yes. Yeah, that is that is specifically in the spec. We're even thinking of dropping patch because our experience so far is it's larger. <laughs> um, so we may drop it, we'll see. Okay, my my input is that it's simpler to not use it. Yeah. And so even even if it isn't larger, although if it's larger and, yeah. and not simpler, then that's definitely a vote against. Yeah, but... definitely a reason to get rid of it. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Um, so replace, once you have the skid, you replace all of the, um, literal strings with the skid and there is at least, um, and, and we make it so that one of the parameters is, is the literal string skid. So that, uh, or sorry, val, uh, item skid and equal to the skid, um, so that it's easy to extract. You don't have to parse out the did or anything like that to figure out what the skid is. We make it very easy for processing to find it. And then obviously to replace it, you take the skid, you pull it out of, out of the parameters, you textually replace it 
in all of these things, recalculate, and it should be the same thing. So that's how you verify. So that calculates the skid, and then you verify it. Make sense? Um, the entry hash is what chains these all together. So the way we do the entry hash is quite similar. We hash the JCS of the entry. Um, again, excluding the um, um, excluding the um, the data integrity proof. So we start with the entry hash on the first one being the skid. On subsequent versions, it is the entry hash from the previous version. And that's what chains everything together. So you you start with the entry hash being the one from the previous, and then you calculate the entry hash for this entry, and then you replace the value with the calculated entry hash. And you wind up with a hash. And finally, you generate a data integrity proof across the did doc and using the entry hash as the challenge and have that signed by an authorized key. And remember, an authorized key is a key that appears in the parameters called update keys. Um, once you have that, you append the entire, you add the, the data integrity proof to the entire entry and append that to the log you have and republish the file as did.json-l. And that's it. So the authorized key, it, does that have to be present in the did doc? Is that a requirement? It is so not in the did doc. It is in the parameters. So one of the things we did was we removed, we moved it from being in the did doc, which is this red thing here, to into this, into the parameters in an array called update keys. So it is not in the did doc. Cool. Okay. I'm still thinking, so, but keep going. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Entry hash here. I've got our version. We've got our time. We've got our set of parameters. So there's our hash algorithm that we're using. We're using method did TDW1. That's our, um, our spec version. Here's our skid. Notice it is the same as um, the skid down in the document. Here, um, Here's our update key. So this is a multi-key public key. And this is a hash of another multi-key that will, in a future version, be added, will be part of an update keys um, array. So this is the key we're committing to rotate it, rotate the key to in the future, the authorization key. And then finally, we have in the yellow here, the data integrity proof at the, uh, at the end of it. So that's what a entry looks like, uh, an initial entry. Obviously, when you do it, you get here patch, and you would do a patch, a JSON patch of how you evolve the did doc. Um, and those just get appended as another line in this uh, file. And that's the basics. So with the key, uh, you mentioned it being in the uh, parameters there. Is that key when resolving the did doc, uh, then put back in the did doc for the resolution? Or is can that be a completely separate key independent of the actual didcom communication? Yes and yes. Um, so it is, it is the key you can, this is an array, so you can have multiple of them. And this must be the thing that sign, one of these must be the thing that signs the proof. Um, however, you could add it to the did doc itself if you wanted to, or you would use entirely separate keys in the did doc. Um, the spec outlines that you could do either of those approaches. The reason we did that was we wanted to make it very explicit, a couple of reasons. Uh, we wanted to make it very explicit what key is authorized to change the did doc. And 
the did core spec is not clear clear on what exactly what key you would use for that purpose in the did doc itself so we decided to make it simple and just extract out the control key from the keys that are used for other purposes um, as the reason for publishing the did doc make sense yeah, that makes sense to me. And actually, from a security uh, perspective, that can actually be really handy because it's like SSL certificates, for example. Their certificate authorities' master keys are not on their automated handing out servers. They use sub keys. And that's the same kind of thing you could do here, where um, if your DIDCOM service had some vulnerability and was... Uh, hijacked, they would not be able, or potentially they would not be able to update the did TDW because they wouldn't have the key. Yeah. And that's the pro point of this, um, the pre-rotation and the next key hash. Um, again, you can do that sort of thing. You've got, um, you isolate the next key from the active key so that when you uh, want to rotate, then this becomes an active key and you have a new one that's off in somewhere else. And, and there is, um, there's a bunch of text I've put in in the implementation guide on, on how you might use this both in a normal operational situation and in a post-quantum compromise situation. How do you rotate to a, a post-quantum key? And generally the answer is you do two updates to the version once to um, generate a new operational key, whether that be post-quantum or not. And, and so you commit to that new um, operational key and then you rotate to that operational key. And in both cases, you, you have a new next hash that, that, can't be, uh, that can't be taken over. Any other questions at this point? Yeah, James and Daniel, I, uh, I wanted to call that in the chat. They they were they want to okay. know like why pre rotation more generally, and you I think you got to part of that. But if you wouldn't mind, yeah, so, waxing a little bit longer. Yeah, so pre rotation is the idea that um, if your active key gets compromised and that's the only key you have, the attacker would be able to simply rotate to a new key that only they know, and then they control the dit. So the idea here is if they if they see this key being used in the wild or, or and they compromise it, they would not be able to rotate the key to something they control because they don't have access to this key. Um, they couldn't post quantum calculate it, use a quantum algorithm to calculate it because this is just the hash of the key. So they don't know what the actual public key is. Um, and um, and and assuming you keep good um, security hygiene and separation of concerns, they would never be able to access this, even if they could compromise this key. So you would be able to rotate to a new key that they do not know. So that's the theory behind it. And do not know could include rotating to a a a post quantum key. Stephen, there, there, it's good. Um, I think there's limitations on using it uh, under the condition where post quantum is, you know, post quantum has arrived, in the sense that if the did is no longer hosted at the original location, and uh, and and a, and a rotation has been used from a pre quantum key to a post quantum key. It's then possible, since there's not necessarily a central authority, this probably gets into witnesses. It, it's, it, it's, it's possible for them to regenerate the document uh, with a new, now that they know the, the, the public key and then they can post quantum and they can quantum derive the private, they could replace uh, or create a, a new form of the document that has their own rotation to their own key and then circulate it without detection. Now, that only works if there are not authoritative places to go find it, like the original loca resolve location or probably witnesses. So interestingly, that is, uh, there is an issue that Timo raised. This was also raised in an email that I got 
Um, so there's an issue exactly that, which is suppose I get this, can I rotate um, and create that? And so the, the, that is where approvers or witnesses come in. And so we do, we have, we have support for witnesses in the design, in this deck, uh, in this spec. We haven't implemented it yet. And there's a PR to put it into the spec. Sorry, I should say it's not quite in the spec yet, but we have the design and, and ready to go. But yes, there is approvers um, that would prevent that. Uh, our, our claim is that that requires both a compromise of the key and a compromise of the website which is relatively you know, harder to do, not impossible, but harder to do. Um, but yes, um, and as a result of that, we put in this idea of, uh, of approvers or witnesses. Same, we just call them approvers at this point. I'd love to hear more about that in a minute, but uh, Daniel yeah. first, he's got his hand up. Oh, okay, Daniel? Yeah, I uh, just wanted to, Complete a thought on on the pre-rotation question. Um, so the the hash parameter within the document, uh, within uh, the words are escaping me. Within the entry, um, that is the hash algorithm that's been used to hash the next key. Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So you yeah you would. This is the first one. Um, so you've generated a key and this is um, going to be used. Now, uh, I, I'll, I'll underline one more thing. In the first entry, the same update keys sign, um, sign the data integrity proof. In future versions, it's the update keys that was active previously. So if you add new update keys, they don't take effect until after it's been approved. Um, so uh, the previous update keys are used to authorize the future changes, um, just to be clear on that. And yes, these next key hashes are hashes of, of, of similar keys to these. Okay, that's the basics. Um, there's a bunch of interesting topics that I'll whip through pretty quickly because we don't have a lot of time. Um, it is just a did. So, um, I tried to get AI to generate a did like like this guy, but I couldn't. Um, but anyway, it's intended entirely a did, discoverable through the identifier and resolved with HTTPS, verifiable by retrieving and processing the log, portable um, by retaining the skid and log, but moving the location and capable of other features. So the first and most important for us is it's just a did. Um, Publishing it, um, we think, would be separate from um, managing the did itself, but it's in an implementation detail. We don't, in the spec, don't say, you know, here's how you publish it. Um, there's a proposed did web server um, that uh, has been published that we think, that I think has really good possibility as the basis of this. This one obviously did web server, but. Um, I've talked to uh, the designer, JC Eberschbach, and he is um, comfortable with it evolving to use DTDW and so on. So um, we think this could be a good companion to entirely separate managing your DID from publishing your DID. Um, could also serve as an approver or an endorser for it. Um, easy to publish as a DID web itself. Um, you simply text replace did tdw with did web and then you insert an also known as for the did tdw and now you have a did doc.json that you can publish as a did web directly um, we don't automatically do it because the um, feeling is that you lose the verifiability and provenance if you use did web directly but but we could discuss that. So that's a, a debate within the team um, so far that's built this tool. Um, I've talked about the authorization. The authorization um, is not in the did doc. Um, we thought about it, decided not to use the did doc keys. Um, and then this is the rules about the first law. The first entry is signed by the first update keys, but all subsequent ones 
are signed by the keys active before this one was published. Um, and then all the update keys are authorized, are ORs. So if you have five keys in there, any of them are authorized. The reason for having multiple keys are things like, um, if you have a service hosting this for you, you might have a, um, that service might provide backup services for you. So it's a service you trust. It might have an update key for your DID um, because you trust it and it could restore control if you lose control of your key, if you forget your key or things like that. Not so much lose control, but if you forget your key and stuff like that. Uh, we don't have multi-sig support, so not um, ands and ors because we think that can be handled external to the spec. That's an implementation detail, if you will. Um, Pre-rotation, we've talked about it enough. Um, so we do have a flag that says pre-rotation is on. When pre-rotation is on, you must use it. And there's a next key hashes that is just a hash of the multi uh, multi key of the public key of a of a future um, ha uh, future key you're going to use. Um, um, that's an array. It does, is that intended to be used in order, or is that intended to allow multiple future next steps for the pre-commitment? Um, so interesting. The way we've done it is when you replace the update keys, you have to up replace the next key hashes. So whenever you use these, you have to replace them. All um, of them? All of them. Um, you can have extra ones in here. Um, if you decide that would be helpful to you, so you could have more than you need. Um, but yeah, they have to be rotate um, used in sync. So an update key has to have a corresponding next key hashes. So they don't they don't build up over time. Um, and, you, and, and if let's say you had spares, so I'm thinking about this. If I had a, a next rotation key, keeping it offline is actually a decent idea. So if I had several different offline locations then I only have to get to one of them, but you're saying that as exactly. soon as I rotate to that new key, then all of the previous rotations now aren't valid anymore. And I have to go replace all my physical, you yeah. know, offline uh, keys with new offline keys. Yeah. So you would have to update all your offline places. Again, this is one that's in, in flex. So that's what we've got right now. And then the other thing we want to push, there is no pre-rotation of did doc keys. So the keys within the did doc, there's no pre-rotation concept in here. Um, that A, that could be added. And second, should there be a did feature to support pre-rotation of did doc keys? Um, to me, that should be a, a, a core feature of, of, did, of dids, but open, open question. Um, so did URL handling, we've got a, and what, what we've done is two implicit services, one for files and one for who is. And so these are standard, if you will, um, did core services. One uses a thing called relative rev from the did core spec. The other uses, um, the link to VP specification from diff for files and who is so files is relatively straightforward this says when you get a did path to file here's how you find the file um the who is is so this is pretty straightforward and we plan to use it for non-creds objects vc rendering objects like oca governance documents and so on um who is um this is the one i pushed before but the idea here is when you resolve who is, you get a verifiable presentation where the did is the subject and you get a bunch of VCs where the did is the subject. So the whole idea is that a did controller gets VCs about itself, about its did, such as what its legal entity is that's behind it, what permits they have to operate and what trust registries they're a part of. So they get a bunch of VCs and they put them in a VP. For every VC that's in there, the did is the subject. And for 
And then at the at the um, then they signed that verifiable present uh, presentation with a key from their from their did doc, and that allows you to do a did slash who is when you get a did and you you know you've 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 received a presentation from a person say, and it's a presentation based on a credential issued by some random did. You can do a did slash who is and find out things about that did. And that's the whole purpose of it. Exactly the same as the, you know, uh, DNS who is, um, but the did version of it. So that's um, what we're um, promoting as far as what can be done with the slash who is endpoint. So that's not a unique who is the, or a, a unique presentation though. It's a generated and stored one. Yeah, yeah. So, so it must be presented by a mechanism that's capable of presenting uh, by a credential type that's capable of not being uniquely presented. For example, I don't think you could do this with a non-creds. Exactly. Cannot do it with a non-creds because it's simply an HTTP GET to get the VP. It's a W3C. Uh, right. By default, it's a W3C VCDM VP. Right. Um, yeah. But you could override the service endpoint to make it some other type. Is there, this is a verifiable presentation. Is yes. there the possibility of returning multiple verifiable presentations? So um, I don't think you need to because it contains multiple VCs within it and it's the VCs that matter. So you get a bunch of VCs, they're all about your did, the credential subject is all your did, you put them all in an array inside your VP and then you sign the VP. That makes sense. Hmm. Could this be used for things like device manufacturers, basically uh, stating the authenticity of the device, even if the uh, did was not initially created for the device? No, because it did has to be the credential subject. Okay. Yeah. So this precludes the use of something like an SD job. No. That's what I'm saying is, well, an SD job, again, doesn't make any sense because you, there's right. no Sorry. protocol for treating. Well, let's, yeah. let's, let's say, let's say, a, uh, let's say but I'm it, just looking at a non-W3C data model credential like, um, like, uh, like JotVC would be a better yeah, example. Yeah, you could do it by, by doing, it's got to be a VP, so it's got to be a verifiable presentation, but you would just adjust the definition of the service endpoint to not end in JSON. I think so the binding JSON between implies that it's a W3C VCM. Anyway, which which is which is weird. Yeah, we're we're off on a tangent, but I think it's yeah. weird that we're going to say the only user of the of a JSON file format is the VCDM. I, I'm that. saying you could have multiple. You could change it, but the, the so there's an implicit service, so you don't have to add it to your did doc, and this should still work with did tdw, um, but you could explicitly put it into your did doc, and use something else, override the default of being a W3C VCDM. Right. By including more stuff in the did doc that you used to override it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, portability, you could move, you can move a did by, by essentially giving it a new web location, but keep the skid the same. Um, ideally you would do that with a redirect. Um, but if there's no redirect, it's up to whoever is resolving it to find it. So that would depend on the use case. Um, but by moving, by changing the did, you're changing the did because you're changing the location, but keeping this. Uh, the skid and the history, you can see that this did used to be called this and now is called that. And so the idea I've, one of the things that I think is is cool about this potentially is that instead of using an email address as your identifier at a service like Google, you would use a did, which could be used by the chat and by the email and by various things. And then when you change services, it's the did that moves and people would be able to know that you are truly the same person on this new service because your history would show you moved it from Google to wherever you moved your, your service to. 
So it's a possibility for that type of thing and retains that portability. For an enterprise um, user, this is needed when you lose control, you lose your web domain, with, when you merge companies and you want to retain the DID and you're now on a new server and things like that. So you take retain the SCID, uniquely identifier could not be replicated, and you keep the history so people can see, oh yeah, you used to be that DID, now you're this DID, but it's the same SCID, same history. Um, Approvers are there. Um, we've got it fairly simple. Watchers are are whatever you want, but um, they're independent of the spec. Uh, approvers are the same as witnesses. Uh, approver is simply someone that you send an entry to to verify before you publish it. So the verifier sends it to approvers. The approvers generate a data integrity proof, and then when you publish the new entry, you include the approver's data integrity proof in the log. Um, so that that enables this approval that you're talking about, Sam, for um, prior to publishing it. So you get um, somebody external so that if you're hacked, you can't just unilaterally do it. They have it sent to the approver for approval. So they would verify it same as they would any other entry, but then they would use some sort of business logic governance, whatever, to decide whether to approve it or not. A couple of things it doesn't handle, um, large log files could be a call home. Um, the no redirect on um, when you move it, and then the version time is verified, but is self-asserted time. So there's no sort of coordination of what time occurred. Specification, a TS version, a Python version. There is also a Rust version that was done by the government in Switzerland or a, or a team member in Switzerland. Um, we'll soon have a link to that one um, for that implementation. And there you go. Sorry, I'm over. Hope that well, was helpful. That's awesome. I wonder, by the way, if you could certify the time with a notarization as an optional feature. That it, it, it's something that I've heard about and talked to and and considered. But um... so um, uh, issues and questions to bring up. One of mine, for example, is like I know we're over time, but but like you use the rays as lines in JSON lines instead of structs. And I'm curious about that and if that's a good idea, um, if it should be moved to structs instead of arrays. Um, but it, do you want me to bring that up on the repo itself? Yes. Yeah. Well, so what we're doing now is moving to a, probably to a t trust over IP task force, although there are political and, and IP issues with that right now, and we have got to sort that out. So um, we will decide where it goes for further incubation. And and a task force to really nail down these things. We are we are making um, what I would consider fairly big. Um, I don't know. They're uh, adding approvers was was a big deal. Um, so those are the types of things we're done. The other things we're doing on it are, are just tweaks to it right now. Um, but obviously, totally open to things like oh, it should be a JWS and not a data integrity um, proof and and stuff like that. And then exactly what you talked about. Cool. I will add a comment about the uh, about the comment I have. Thank you, Stephen, for presenting this. this is super valuable, um, and we'll be able to point people to the recording of this, uh, to um, so they can refer to that. And I think that's in insanely helpful. So appreciate your time and and the presentation. And thanks, folks. Um, we will see you all next week. Um, and to those of you inclined for the U.S. holiday, hope your holiday is a great one. And we will see you next time. Take care, all. Thank you very much. Great presentation.